In this first lab, students are going to learn about the scientific method. Before we look at what the scientific method is, why it's important, I want to point out that before every lab, there are a set of lab objectives that we want students to be able to accomplish by the time they complete the lab, as well as a list of key words that students will be held accountable for. So be before beginning lab, always make sure that you are reading through the lab objectives and you are beginning to familiarize yourself with these keywords. You will find these keywords throughout the lab and these will be the bolded terms that students are going to be held accountable for in regards to the definition and being able to use them in context. So what exactly is the scientific method? The scientific method is basically a series of steps that are used by biologists and other scientists to really enhance the body of scientific knowledge. And before we actually look at each of the individual steps, it's important to understand what the scientific method is used to investigate in regards to, well, what is science? And science is basically a way of knowing. In biology, it's about learning about life and natural phenomenon. And the scientific method can help us learn about um, natural phenomenon. Now, one of the issues that we find is that sometimes we see things that are portrayed as science, but they really cannot be tested rigorously using the scientific method. Um, you can't generate repeatable data. These sort of claims or beliefs that are presented as science, but really lack that repeatable data that can be generated with this with the scientific method um, those claims and beliefs are referred to as pseudoscience so an example of pseudoscience is astrology astrology is basically a type of pseudoscience that involves forecasting sort of earth and human events by observing and interpreting the, the stars the sun um, um, sort of looking from the outside in, it might appear like astrology is very scientific. There's a lot of data that may support it. But as you look more closely, what you find is that it really does lack objective, repeatable data that can be generated using the steps of the scientific method. So with that in mind, what are those steps that um, sort of are used to generate this, this knowledge. What are the steps of the scientific method? We're gonna organize those in the scientific method into six steps, and those steps are listed here. Observation, question, generate a hypothesis, experiment, draw conclusions, publish conclusions. And what I wanna do in sort of this first video is just go through what those steps sort of mean using a sort of a general example um, sometimes students are unaware that we actually use the scientific method in our everyday lives when we're solving problems. And so we want to sort of use a general example. And that example is going to use the flashlight. And I'll then define some terms and then we will complete this video. Um, I will make a second video where I go through the scientific method using a biological example. So do um, keep in mind that this that there will be sort of two videos that help you to really begin to understand what the scientific method is. So starting with the first step of the scientific method, observation, um, I think it's important to understand that we make observations in many ways. Um, we observe the natural world around us, not only by using sight, um, but also by using our hearing or our taste or smelling or being able to touch. Um, ultimately, Observations can really happen anywhere, including your home, outside, you know, no matter where you are, you're sort of constantly observing the things that are happening around you. So if we think about this in regards to a general example, let's say that you go to turn a flashlight on and when you push the button, it doesn't go on and you observe that, right? You know that, you know, it, it, it should go on, but it, it doesn't. So the next thing that we sort of naturally do is we ask ourselves a question, right? Um, observations lead to questions. The questions are often in the form of how or what or why. You know, in this case, why doesn't the flashlight work, right? Now in science, um, 
there are limits to our ability to answer questions. So for a question to sort of be looked at scientifically, we have to be able to define it, uh, really define it and, and know what we're looking at or what we're trying to address. And it has to be testable. We have to be able to, 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 to generate data that helps us to answer that question. So in this case, you know, why doesn't the flashlight work? Well, we can we, we can test that, right? Maybe it's the maybe it's the batteries, maybe it's the light bulb, maybe it's something with the wiring, right? So again, we would be able to investigate why the flashlight isn't working. So naturally, right, after we develop that question, it leads to this third step that's that we refer to as generating the hypothesis. When we generate a hypothesis, um, it really, a hypothesis really just proposes a testable explanation to, to answer the question we're asking, right? So if the question we're asking is, why doesn't the flashlight work? Your hypothesis might be as sort of concise and straightforward as the flashlight doesn't work because the batteries are dead, right? Again, a hypothesis is just that sort of testable explanation that answers the question. Now, after we generate a hypothesis, we would then want to test that hypothesis. And we test hypotheses through experimentation. Now with our general example here with the flashlight, the experiment is fairly simple, right? We're going to take out the old batteries and we're going to put in new batteries. Once we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the results, right? We're going to go ahead and push the button and see whether or not the flashlight goes on. Well, when we after we do the experiment and we look at the results, we then draw conclusions, sort of this fifth step. So what does it mean to draw conclusions? Well, at the end of the experiment, we really want to know um, whether or not the results supported the hypothesis, right? So when we flip the switch on the light bulb or we push the button, did the light bulb go on? Excuse me, did the flashlight go on? Um, if the flashlight went on when we changed the batteries, then what we would say is that the data supported our hypothesis. If we changed out the batteries and the flashlight did not go on, then what we would say is that our data failed to support the hypothesis. Again, the hypothesis doesn't have to be right. It's, it's perfectly all right if it's incorrect. It still provides information. So in this case, if you flip the switch and the, and the flashlight didn't go on, right? Well, we ruled out the fact that it was the batteries and we could go back and maybe the next hypothesis was that we thought the flashlight didn't work because of the light bulb, right? Now, normally once you would do this, if this was sort of a biological example, the next step and the final step would be to publish our results, publish the conclusions. Now, in this case of sort of this general example, obviously we aren't going to publish that you fixed your light bulb in any sort of scientific journal or on the internet, um, but we will expand on what this means when we, in the next video, when we look at that biological example. Now, one other thing, um, that I want to do before I go through sort of a biological example with you is I want to define some key terms. Um, sometimes we hear students, and actually we see this even when we watch TV, that words like hypothesis and theory get interchanged. And in biology, these words are not synonyms. They, they shouldn't be interchanged. They mean very, very different things. A hypothesis proposes a testable explanation to answer the question being asked. A theory means something significantly different, okay? A theory is generally much more broad in scope than a hypothesis. Um, theories tend to um, be supported by large um, bodies of evidence, um, so lots of sufficient experimental data that supports the theory, and it also tends, theories tend to be widely accepted by the scientific community. So, for example, if we think about what evolution theory is, evolution theory says that populations change over time. They change genetically, both in their allele and their sort of genotype frequencies, and we can go out and we can actually measure that. Um, the theory of evolution has been supported by numerous different scientific groups. There's lots of different types of data that support that. The fossil record, homology, um, 
biogeography are just a couple of examples of how the theory of evolution is supported. Um, so one of the things that we want students to understand is that it's not, we can't use the words theory and hypotheses interchangeably. Okay, they mean very different things. And we want students to understand how they're different from one another. And we want students to use them properly, okay, in context or in writing or when we're asking um, you to do things, especially when it comes to maybe generating reports or working through questions in the lab book. Now, in addition to that, oftentimes we hear people or see words like hypothesis and predictions interchanged. Now do keep in mind, again, that what a hypothesis is, is it's this testable explanation that answers a scientific question being asked. Um, a good hypothesis should really be three things. It should be testable, it should be falsifiable, and it should lead to the predictions. And this is why, again, we, we aren't going to use the words hypothesis and predictions interchangeably. Now, before we expand on what predictions are, do keep in mind, uh, or maybe I want you to keep in mind, what the word falsifiable means. It really means that the hypothesis can be shown to be false by finding evidence against it. Um, it's, it's a perfectly okay to say that the hypothesis is incorrect or that you didn't, the data that you collected, you know, it, it failed to support the hypothesis, the evidence just, it, 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 it didn't support what you had thought. That's okay. I know sometimes we don't want to be wrong, um, but that is important data. It's data that then others, once you publish, can go and work off of. If you found and it that it doesn't work, somebody else may want to build off of that versus repeating exactly what you did. So again, just because maybe you failed to provide data that supports your hypothesis, you know, somebody else might say, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. I like what they did. I'm going to see about addressing that from maybe a different angle. So do keep in mind um, that, you know, it's okay if you fail to support your hypothesis. Now, what does it mean to lead to predictions? Predictions are really these logical statements that explain what's expected if the hypothesis is supported. Okay, oftentimes when we talk about predictions, we, we generate them in the form of if-then statements. So if the hypothesis is correct, then this is the outcome I expect, right? So if we go back to our general um, example, right, where we were testing and trying to figure out why our flashlight didn't work, the idea there would be, well, if the hypothesis is correct and the flashlight's not turning on because of the batteries, then when we change the batteries, the flashlight should go on, right? So it's this idea of if my hypothesis is right, then this is the outcome I expect when I change those batteries. So again, sort of in conclusion, to wrap up this first little video on the scientific method, please make sure that not only do you know the steps of the scientific method, but you, that you really take a close look at this vocabulary and that you're using it properly, that we're not interchanging words like hypothesis and theory and prediction and sort of using them interchangeably because they really do specifically mean different things. And we want students to be able to use those in context, in the proper context. If there are any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your instructor.